everyone. I want to welcome you all to week five of our financial wellness boot camp. I hope you're all doing very well and you're staying safe and you're staying healthy. Um, this is lesson five this week, and we are going to be going over how to get rid of debt. So we have a lot of great stuff to go over. Let me introduce myself really quickly. My name is Jordan Fuller. I'm a financial professional here at Walio, and I'm excited to be able to spend the next four lessons with you and give you some great information to help you along on your financial wellness journey. So let's take a look and see where we are in our boot camp structure. So we've gone through lessons one through four. We're on lesson five. So you're officially a third of the way done. So congratulations to all our participants. So basically, what is the point of this whole boot camp? You know, we all went to school for anywhere between 16 and 20 years, um, depending on if you stopped after high school or after college, even more, actually, if you went on to get graduate degrees. But why did we do all of that? Why do we take um, go spend all those years in school? Well, we did it because we wanted to learn how to make money, right? <laughs> you know, you go to school, get good grades so you can get a good job and make some good money. I mean, it sounds like a solid plan. But the question is, how much of that time did we spend learning how to manage the money that we would earn someday? Days, weeks, few months? Well, sad truth is, unless you studied finance in college, then you probably took no more than one or two classes in regards to how to manage money. And so how well did that education really prepare you for real life? It didn't do the best job, did it? So now that you've had some real life experience yourself with money, doesn't it make sense that you would spend a little bit more time re-educating yourself on how money really works in the real world? And so over these next several weeks, these next eight weeks, you're going to have eight more hours with us to learn these lessons that we sh you should have been taught a long time ago, frankly. And so we're going to make sure that these next eight hours are going to be time well spent for you. We're going to share some valuable financial principles and strategies to help you get on track and stay on track financially. So debt. Now here's a question for you. When you think of money, what comes to mind? Do you see dollar bills in your mind or coins or maybe even a piggy bank flashes in there? Um, I know whenever anyone asks me to think about money, I always think I need to go get some more, but that's just me. I don't know if you feel the same. Um, but now I want you to think about something else. I want you to think about debt. When I say debt, what's the first thing that flashes into your mind? Maybe it's nothing. Because here's the thing, despite debt becoming an everyday norm, it doesn't physically exist the same way money does, right? You can't hold debt in your hands, really. You know, debt only exists because society has decided to give it a collective value. And the funny thing is that pretty much everybody has debt, but is it normal? You know, there's this idea that it's okay to carry debt around because, well, everyone else is doing the same. You know, I like to think of this as the normalization of debt. So since debt has become such a norm for so many Americans, you know, we've kind of lost this urgency, it seems, to get out of it. You know, the mindset can easily become, well, these minimum payments, they're so small, they don't really affect or impact my lifestyle too much. You know, why should I rush? You know, being in debt isn't so bad, right? <clears throat> Wrong. You know, that mentality will cost you a lot in the long run. So today, what we're going to go over is I'm going to show you exactly how much debt ultimately costs you. We're going to go over how to get out of debt, <clears throat> excuse me, and then how to build a system in your personal finances to avoid getting into new debt and to live your life money stress-free. <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> So let's start our lesson with the two rules of borrowing that we taught you in lesson two. So according to this simple rule, there are two types of debt. There's good debt and there's bad debt. Now, it's okay and it's recommended to borrow if the debt that you're taking on is going to increase your income or it's gonna force you to save. Bad debt is everything else. And that's when we don't recommend that you take it on, right? That's pretty easy to follow. It's really those two simple rules. Let's actually take a closer look into what exactly good debt is. Excuse me. 
Now, there are five major things we consider that it makes sense to borrow money for. Let's go from left to right. So start off here with business loans. Now, if you're trying to launch a new business to generate new income or expand an existing business to increase your income flow, then you might apply for something called a small business loan, right? So if the new income generated is larger than the cost of having the loan, then that's the time when we would consider that good debt, right? So it's the best example of how to use borrowed money. It's going to be generating you more income, right? So then we can get over here to real estate. Now, real estate's a little tricky. It could be either a type of business or it could be speculation. Now, it's good to buy real estate and rent it out and generate some new income. That's good. However, you should be very cautious if you're getting into real estate in the speculation that it's going to appreciate over time. Now, when you take on debt to buy real estate, you want to make sure that that real estate is going to be rented out to reliable tenants. And it's going to bring you an income that more than it costs you to own it, right? You want to be bringing in more money than you're pushing out. And I'm sure all of you know, the coronavirus has put many real estate investors out of business. You know, people were borrowing to buy properties and list them on Airbnb. And then unfortunately, that hasn't turned out so well. Their business is suffering dramatically now because of this unforeseen situation. Then from real estate, we're going to go over here into investments. So now investments is in anything that grows in value. So that could be stocks, commodities, or as simple as an investment into your friend's business. You know, an investment, if, it, if the investment expects to grow in value at a higher rate than the debt you're taking on, then that could be a good investment. But again, just like with real estate, you want to avoid speculations. You know, the Great Depression back in the 1920s was caused by people taking on debts to buy stocks and then filing for bankruptcies when those stocks didn't appreciate as much as they'd hoped for. You know, then you have things like the 2002.com bubble bursting, the 2008 housing crisis and, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic we're having this year, you know, nobody can predict what will come 10 years from now. So you want to be very cautious, avoid speculation, diversify, and insure your money when you can. Then we're going to get over here into mortgages. Now we see mortgages on your primary home as something that forces you to save money. And what we mean by that is you need to live somewhere no matter what, right? So why would you want to pay money to a landlord when you could be paying it to yourself? So that $500 or $700 that will go to your mortgage principal, that would be increasing your home's equity. And that would be for you and your family to use. Why don't you do that rather than give that same money to a landlord who's going to have that go to their home equity when they're just renting you the property, Right. And then last but not least, you have education or student loans. Now you may use the student loans to fund your college education. And you know, earning a college degree usually means that you're gonna make more money over the course of your lifetime. Now, according to statistics, the median earnings of a college graduate is gonna be higher than someone who just has a high school diploma and the unemployment rate is going to be lower. However, if not handled properly, student loans may snowball, <clears throat> excuse me, and cause real financial hardship, not to mention the missed investment opportunities. In fact, speaking of this, let's take a closer look at how student loans can hurt you. Now there are currently 44 million student loan borrowers in the United States and 71% of students who have loans, they end up leaving college with debt to pay. Now on average, students today are paying over twice what their parents paid in order to attend college. And student loans are now currently the second largest debt category in the United States, second only to mortgages. So that means it's higher than all auto loan debt and all credit card debt. It's higher than those two. But really, when I tell you this, who's actually surprised by these statistics nowadays? Now, out of all these numbers on screen, you have a few numbers here. Which one do you think is the most concerning to me, at least? What do you think would give me the most um, cause for you know, concern? The 1.5 trillion, the 31,000, the nearly 400. Actually, believe it or not, the one number on this screen that concerns me the most is actually the smallest number, this 21 over here. This is the one that makes me a little nervous. Let me see, tell you why. 21 
21 years more specifically is half of our entire working life. Think about it. When you leave college until the time you retire, 21 years is about half of the time you would spend working. Now, if someone were to tell me that I owed $31,000 in debt, I wouldn't be happy about that, but I could deal with it. I'd figure out how to work that out. But if someone else told me that I spend half of my working life in debt, half of it, that's what would make me run away screaming. And I think you should too. Now, I want you to remember the compounding interest rule that we went over in lesson two. You know, we call it the rule of 72. Now, this chart shows how compounding interest works if you invest for your entire working career. So 40 years, right out of college, all the way until retirement. So you see how for the first 20 years here, your money's barely growing at all. And you can see after that, this is where it really starts to get its legs working. This is where the compounding really starts to pound, right? You can see that this is where it starts growing really fast. So people who spend half of their life repaying student loans, or I should say this half of their life repaying student loans, they are gonna be missing out on a huge compounding interest opportunity in their lifetime, right? So again, forget about the $31,000 in average student loan debt. You know, I can worry about, I can figure that out. I want you to think about the time that you're losing out on. Now you can always make more money, but what you can't do is buy more time. So what is, why does it take so many people so much time to repay their student loans? I mean, that's a loaded question. There could be a myriad of different reasons. You know, there could be, for example, some people, they actually never needed that loan in the first place. They were just convinced of it by predatory lenders who needed to meet their quotas. You know, unfortunately, there are those people out there who exist. You know, sometimes people make a critical mistake in selecting their major in college. And while it's an enjoyable subject to study, it's not really practical in terms of making an income after graduation. Some people, they experienced a major economic disruption, like the one we're going through now with the COVID-19, or if we're looking at past situations, the dot-com bubble bursting or the housing crisis again, you know, those kind of things can throw people off. And then, you know, some people probably didn't take it seriously, unfortunately. They kind of have that normalization of debt mentality that I was speaking about a little bit earlier, where, you know, the payments, they don't really impact their lifestyle too greatly, so they don't make it a priority to get rid of it as soon as they possibly can. Now, whatever your reason was up until today, I hope that you now you have a little bit uh, more motivation to solve this problem and then to minimize your missed opportunity. So one of the common mistakes with student loans is to only pay the minimum payment. Now, consider this example here. Now, let's say you have $30,000 in student loans that you need to pay off over the course of 40 years, and you have that loan at a 5% interest rate. Now, now, the minimum payment you need to pay each month might not hurt your lifestyle too much. Now, by the time you pay off that loan, you will have paid a total of $69,436. That's nearly $40,000 in interest over the lifespan of that loan. However, the biggest loss is going to be in lost opportunity. Now, what would happen if you had taken that same $40,000 in interest and instead of, invest, instead of paying it in interest, you invested it at 7%? Rather than paying it to the bank, you saved it for yourself. That same interest would have grown to $275,000 over that course of 40 years. So when you think about it, the true cost of the loan, which is the interest you had to pay, as well as your lost opportunity, you put these numbers together, the true cost of this loan was $315,000. If that's not scary enough, let's look at it a little bit differently. If you're only paying the minimum payment on this student loan, every dollar that you owe ends up costing you 10. That should scare you a little bit. <laughs> now, what would happen excuse me, if we went to a different scenario and rather than paying the minimum payment, you paid an extra $150 a month towards that principal. You, what would happen is you would pay off that same loan rather than 40 years, you would cut that loan uh, life by four and you would pay it off in 11 years. Sounds a little bit better, right? Also, you will have only paid $9,000 in interest. Again, cutting that, cutting that interest paid by four times right? So 
I want you to notice how much smaller it is costing you by just by paying a little bit extra on those monthly payments. We haven't even talked about how much smaller that lost opportunity is right here. So look at what the true cost is in this scenario versus this one. So you can obviously see what our advice would be. It would be to calculate the cost of your debts early on and pay more than your minimum payments every month. This is gonna benefit you highly in the long run, okay? So if you have a federal student loan, what you can do is you can postpone your payments in select circumstances through either deferment or forbearance. Now, the major difference is that forbearance always continues to accrue interest, right? While deferment is interest free. <coughs> Excuse me. You're going to pay more in the long run if you use forbearance because of the accrued interest while you are postponing your payments. Now, forbearance of student loans for early, for years, excuse me, forbearance for student loans for years may cause your debt to balloon to almost double the amount. So be conscious when deferring your loan payments and only use this option in the case of a true hardship. Now loans can be consolidated in the consolidation loan program. Now consolidation is a way to make repaying student loans more manageable and it possibly reduces the monthly payment. Now, because consolidation usually increases the period of time you have to repay your loans, you will likely make more payments and pay more in interest than would have been the case if you hadn't consolidated. Now, income-driven repayment plans and loan forgiveness, they go together hand in hand. And if it's planned properly, they both can save you a lot of money. It's a powerful strategy available to some federal student loan holders. I'm actually going to expand on this topic in the next slide, so I'll get into that then. Now, refinancing your student loans can lower your interest rate and reduce your monthly payments, and it can reduce your monthly payments and the costs overall as well. Now, all of these options listed here, they're all available for federal student loan holders. For private student loan holders, there's only one option available. It's going to be this last one, refinancing. Federal loans can be forgiven, where private loans have to be repaid. There is literally no other option. Student loans are one of the few debt obligations that is not protected by bankruptcy law. That means that you cannot discharge your loan even if you file for bankruptcy. So with private loans, you're pretty much on the hook until it's fully repaid. Now, if you have a federal student loan, do not refinance to a private loan without consultation, even if the interest rates look attractive. All right, so once it's refinanced to private, then you're going to lose all of these benefits here, these first five here. You're going to lose all those benefits and protections that come with federal student loans. So let me show you a little bit more about how, how income-driven repayment plans work, as well as how they work with loan forgiveness programs. Now, when the time comes to repay your loan, you're usually going to be put into something called a standard loan repayment plan. Right, which means this is when your payment is going to be fixed based on your loan amount and your interest rate. However, you can change that to an income driven repayment plan. Now, with income driven repayment plans, the amount that you owe each month is going to be based on your income, right? If you don't make much, basically, you don't pay much. That's the gist of how it works. The idea behind it being that if your education worked, out for you the way you wanted it to, then your income should reflect that and make the payment easy to manage. However, if your education didn't work out for you and your income can't make the numbers work, then the payment would be reduced to something more affordable. Now, student loan forgiveness is not a reduction in debt principle. It is full forgiveness of the loan. So when a loan is forgiven, you don't need to repay it at all. The balance is canceled. It works as a payment clock in another way of speaking. So I want you to imagine, like say you lent a friend a good deal of money, right? And as they paid you back diligently month after month, towards the end, you decide to say to them, you know what? Don't worry about the rest. You've done such a good job paying me back. We're even, I'll forgive what's left over. That's it. How exactly how forgiveness works. You pay your loan on time for 20 years, no matter how much debt is left over, the federal government is gonna forgive that remainder completely. Again, you can't do that with private loans. So let's say you have a student loan with a standard repayment plan with a monthly payment of $750. As you're repaying it back, you don't have any money left for investing in your future or, or building any savings. So if you switch that from a standard repayment plan to an income-driven repayment plan, 
then your monthly payment would drop significantly. Then you could invest half of that saved amount and then you could spend the other half. So you'd be able to start building your investment nest egg and also have a better lifestyle. And then after 20 years, your loan balance would be forgiven, but the money you invested, you would get to keep for yourself and your family. So what I want you to understand is how income-driven repayment plans and loan forgiveness work together. You can switch to a lower monthly payment with the income-driven plan, and then you'd have the entire rest of the loan balance canceled through loan forgiveness. So independent of one each other, these things are amazing, but if you put them together, then that's when the magic happens, right? So we've gone a little bit over what good debt is. Now, obviously on the flip side of that, there's bad debt. So everything that's not good debt is bad debt. And we can't possibly list everything that would be considered bad debt, but we can mention a few. So let's start over here. There's payday loans or cash advances. This is probably the worst of the worst type of debt. You know, this, these are ones where interest rates with fees factored in may be as high as 300%. Yes, that's not a typo. It's not 30%, it's 300. So if you can't pay off the loan according to its terms, then unfortunately you may be stuck taking out another loan, furthering the hole that you're digging yourself, right? And adding to that debt balance. So I want you to avoid these loans at any cost. Right? Certainly, I hope nobody on this call uses that service. And if you do, it's your civic duty <laughs> to tell people that you do know using it not to do it, right? And we're going to get over here, excuse me, to personal loans for discretionary expenses or things that lose value. These are going to be things like, you know, furniture, appliances, electronics, you know, just crazy things that sometimes people take out loans for that they don't really need to even expensive weddings or something like that. Just things that are just not gonna hold value over time. It's just not really worth getting yourself in debt over. And then last but not least, there's high interest credit cards when they're not paid in full. That's an important caveat, the when they're not paid in full part, right? So what I wanna get across with that is, it's okay to pay for uh, things, your day-to-day -day living expenses with credit cards. You know, There's no problem with that. So whether that be clothes, dinners, essentials, that's fine. What's not okay is carrying over the debt balances from those cards month to month. Credit cards should be used responsibly and paid in full at the end of each billing cycle. Otherwise, you're going to start building up a significant amount of interest, right? Now, this slide shows the true cost of credit card purchases when they're not repaid in full every cycle. Now, the true cost consists of interest and fees you're paying to the bank and the lost opportunity. So let's take a look at some specific numbers. Let's consider a scenario. This here, this is Mr. Jones. We've met him before. He's been in a couple of our lessons. Now, Mr. Jones, he owes $5,000 on his credit card and he decides that he's gonna make $100 monthly payments until that $5,000 balance is paid off. Now, if Mr. Jones does that, it's gonna take him exactly 10 years for him to repay his debt. Now, the total amount of payments over that 10 years is going to be about $12,000, right? And the interest paid to the bank is going to be about $7,000. How does that sound for a $5,000 purchase? You know, is it convenient? Maybe. Is it worth it? I don't think so. <laughs> but what if, instead of giving away that $7,000 in interest to the bank, what if Mr. Jones invested that at 7%? Again, this is not new money coming out of his pocket. This is just investing the same money that he would have been giving away to the bank in interest. What happened was this money, the $7,000, would have earned Mr. Jones $4,000 in interest if he had done that instead. This is his lost opportunity right here. I want you to remember what Einstein said when it came to the rule of compounding interest. He who earns it, or he who understands it earns it, and he who doesn't pays it. So the true cost of the credit card, in this case anyway, is the $7,000 in interest plus the $4,000 in lost gains. So for that $5,000 credit card balance, he ends up losing out Mr. Jones on $11,000 total. In fact, let's look at it from a different angle. For every dollar that Mr. Jones spent, he ended up losing out on $2.2. .2. Now, you know the scariest part though? 
that's not even the minimum payment. Things get even worse when you decide to only pay the minimum payment. I mean, look at Mr. Jones's scenario over here. Now the bank is gonna adjust that minimum payment in order to keep you on the hook as long as possible. Let's look at this excerpt from a real credit card statement. Now you can see here, it takes 17 years to pay, repay a $4,000 balance, right? If you're only using a minimum payment. 17 years and $17,000 of true cost if you count the lost opportunity. Do you actually know what this kind of warning reminds me of? It reminds me of the same warnings that we put on uh, packs of cigarettes that tobacco companies put on the packs of cigarettes in order to save lives. I mean, don't these kind of look a little similar? It's kind of crazy, right? Now, everyone knows that smoking kills, but not everyone knows the true cost of carrying over credit card balances. I hope you know now, right? So bad money habits, similar to smoking, they cause disastrous long-term results. With cigarettes, your health is ruined. With bad money habits, your financial health is ruined. Bad money habits need to be fixed, and the sooner it's fixed, the faster the long-term financial health can be achieved. So I can't stress enough, never just pay the minimum payments on your bad debt. You need to have a repayment plan that is more than that because paying the minimum payment is going to be very, very expensive in the long run. So wrapping up the good and bad debt topic, I want you to think about what interest is. Interest is the penalty you pay for the right to own something in advance that you can't afford now. So try to think like an investor every time you do something that's going to increase your debt. Ask yourself, do I expect to make a profit off of this purchase? If the answer is no, then consider waiting until you can pay cash to buy that item. There's no point in getting into more debt for something that you don't plan on making money off of later. Now let's go into a few different strategies on how you can get rid of debt. So the snowball debt elimination approach is very easy to understand and follow. And it's actually the preferred and recommended approach of personal money management expert, Dave Ramsey. Now this approach doesn't produce the best results mathematically, but I still like it because of its simplicity and its easiness to use. So this method actually works best for people who are in complete financial stress and disarray and they need fast, positive achievements to cheer them up and motivate them to get out of debt quickly, all right? So here's how it works. List all your debts. What you're gonna do is list all your debts from the smallest balance to the largest balance, right? So what you're gonna do is go, you have the smallest one here is debt A and we're listing them all down here to debt D. Now what you're gonna do is you're gonna pay the minimum payment on all of these debt balances, except for the smallest one. Right? You're going to pay as much as you can towards the smallest one. So in our example, we have $100 going to debt A and then $50 going through debts B, C, and D. Now, what you're going to do is that once you finish paying off debt A, you would then take that $100 payment and then apply it to the next smallest debt, in this case, debt B. So you can see that it's snowballing down to the next set of debt. And so then you would take that and you would apply it to debt B while you're still paying the minimums on C and D. Now then... Once you paid off debt B, you would then take that $150 and then start applying it to debt C. And you'll keep doing this so on and so forth until all of your debts were paid off. That makes sense? So you can see how the payment is snowballing and increasing as you pay off debts. This is why it's called the snowball method. Now, another popular debt repayment method is called the avalanche method. Now, some variation of this method is recommended by Susie Ormond. Now, Susie Ormond is another personal money management expert. Now, in the snowball method, we, we ordered our debts by amount from smallest to largest and paid the minimum payments on all of them except for the smallest one. Now, with the avalanche method, we order the debts by interest rate from highest to lowest. Does that make sense? And just like with Snowball, what we're going to do is we're going to pay the most amount on the highest interest and then pay the minimums on the other debts, right? And then what we're going to do is we're going to start paying off the debt that has the highest interest rate first. And then as we do that, 
we take that payment once we're done and we apply it to the next debt with the highest interest rate, okay? And then once we start paying, finish debt B, then we apply it to debt C. And then once we do that, we uh, pay it off, we apply it to debt, debt A. Does that make sense? So you're paying off the highest interest rate first and then the lowest interest rate last. So that's the only difference between Snowball and Avalanche. It's the order in which you pay the debt off, right? So you want to pay off your debt and you're deciding which method to use. Now the snowball method or the avalanche method, you know, which one is the better one? We get this question a lot. Let's actually take a look. So let's say you have four debts, one, two, three, and $4,000 each. We have a total of $10,000 and we have about $400 we can pay a month toward these debts. Now, if we were using the snowball method, you would list the debt by amount from smallest, excuse me, smallest to largest. And then you would pay the minimum debt on debts three through four or debt B through D in this case, I should say, and then pay as much as you could, the maximum to debt A. And so after doing this and paying off in that same order we went over previously, if we use the snowball method, we would pay off that $10,000 in 33 months and our total payments would equal just under $13,000 here. So $12,979. Now, if we went over here and used Avalanche, if we decided to use this method, again, we would list our debts based on interest rate now. So we list the uh, debt with the highest interest rate first and the smallest interest rate last, right? And then we would make all of the minimum payments on these three smaller ones and pay the maximum we could towards the biggest one. And then we would take the same method, you know, pay them all off in order. Now, if we use Avalanche, we would pay the same debt off in 31 months and our total payments would equal $12,359. So you'd be done two months sooner and you would pay about $620 less in interest. So you can see that Avalanche is a little bit more mathematically efficient than Snowball. So it's pretty clear why Susie Orman prefers the Avalanche method. It's gonna yield the better results mathematically speaking. So then why does Dave Ramsey prefer the Snowball method? Well, it's because it has a higher chance of working. Yes, you're gonna pay a little bit more money for it, but you have higher chances of overall success. Now, why is that? Well, it's because you pay off smaller balances faster and you declutter yourself. So take a look at this. While the avalanche method is still paying off the highest interest debt, the snowball method has paid off a bunch of smaller balance debts, right? So as you pay these smaller balances, you don't need to manage them anymore, they're done. With Avalanche, you still need to manage all these small balances and you have a chance of forgetting to pay them on time and then incur some late fees. Now, past due fees negate all the advantages of an otherwise more mathematically sound method. You know, we're all humans, right? We're not robots. We're not perfect. We forget things. That's to be expected. Now, the Avalanche method, it requires stronger discipline. The Snowball method, it makes up for that a little bit. So here at Walio, we're not really advocating one method versus another. You know, we believe that you should choose whatever method fits you best. If you have a few larger debts, Avalanche might be the best method for you. If you have a lot of smaller ones, Snowball might be the right fit. If you're a very disciplined person and you don't really forget anything, go with Avalanche. Otherwise, Snowball might be your best bet. And once you pay off your credit card debt, you can put your card aside. You can keep it in your wallet and don't use it or you can keep it and use it. I mean, do whatever you wanna do, but whatever you do, don't close it. Now, closing a credit card will negatively affect your credit score. And credit agencies, they look into a parameter called credit card utilization ratio. It's calculated as a relation between your total credit card balance and your available balance, right? So for example, say you have two credit cards, right? Each one has a credit line of $5,000, which makes your total credit line $10,000. Now the first card is paid off and it's open while the second card has a balance of $4,000. In this scenario, your card utilization ratio is gonna be 0.4, which means you're utilizing your cards at 40%. Now, if you come over here, if you close that credit card that you paid off, your debt is gonna be the same, but your total credit line is gonna be smaller. See, it's $5,000 now. In this case, your credit card utilization ratio is going to be 0.8, which means you're utilizing 80% of your available line. Now, the higher this number is, the bigger negative impact your credit score is going to have. 
Now the perfect ratio is gonna be around 0.3 or 30% utilization rate. So once you've paid off your cards, whatever you do, don't close them. Now, another question we get is, should you consolidate your debt or not? Now, debt consolidation is when you take on a new larger debt and use it to pay off several smaller debts. Now, this brings the convenience of a single larger bill rather than several smaller bills. Also, frequently, debt consolidation brings a smaller interest rate, which allows you to save money compared to the higher interest rates on credit cards. You know what else this does? It actually increases your credit score because your overall credit limit becomes bigger and the credit card utilization rate becomes smaller. So there's another plus there. So you have one simpler payment, smaller interest rate, increased credit score. What's not to love, right? What could be a reason not to do something like this? Well, there is one significant risk. Can you guess what that risk is? It's you. You are the risk. Hi, Mr. Jones. <laughs> now we see the same mistake people make with debt consolidation over and over again. They fail to change their bad financial habits. You know, debt consolidation brings relief. You know, people relax a little bit. They forget the pain they were in before. And then they continue carrying on the same lifestyle. You know, and in no time, they find themselves in even worse financial situations with all of their credit card balances back. Now, if you do decide to consolidate your debt, I want you to think about how you got into that situation in the first place. What bad habits do you need to change in order to avoid that in the future? Be conscious of why you're consolidating. You're not just doing this to make your life a little bit easier. You're trying to pursue a more noble goal. You're trying to get out of debt completely. Never forget how bad it feels to be in debt and the constant stress associated with that. You've been there and you don't want to get back there. Don't take on any new debt until you repay the consolidated one. I mean, that seems like obvious thing to say, but you know, some people you don't know. <laughs> and then a big one, pay the same amount to the consolidated debt that you would have paid to the smaller debts combined. You know, in this example, the bill is $250. So always pay that $250, don't pay less than that. And then last but not least, use our simple budgeting method and then budget that $250 payment in, in, as a bill in that, in that formula so that you can calculate your spendable accordingly. So as I've mentioned before, to avoid the scenario of getting back into debt, debt, Dave Ramsey, he actually recommends a very simple and effective solution. Take a pair of scissors, cut your credit cards in half and throw them away. It's called plastic surgery. Just kidding. I mean, but I can't tell you it works. I mean, you can't get into credit card debt if you don't have credit cards, right? Well, here at Walio, we actually don't recommend going to such an extreme. You know, we actually love credit cards for many reasons. You know, we believe credit cards bring a lot of value when they're used responsibly. So here are a few of the most popular credit card perks um, that you can get. There's cash back. You know, there are certain credit cards that'll pay you one and a half or even 2% for every transaction. Essentially, it's a check you can write yourself every year to spend on anything you want. So if you're some people, they're uh, like buying the new smartphone every time it comes out every year. And, you know, when they have enough cash back from their credit cards accumulated, well, that's when they can get their new phone. It's pretty good practice, but that's what you want to spend it on. Also, there's things like travel insurance or car rental insurance, fraud protection, uh, purchase protection, all kinds of stuff that you can use miles if you want to uh, travel, all that kind of stuff. So those are some of the most popular perks that come for free and they can actually save you money if you use your card responsibly. So again, we love credit cards and we never advocate cutting them up and throwing them away. In fact, we actually recommend you get the best cards with the maximum perks that fit your lifestyle. But always pay that new balance in full using that automated system that I'm about to show you very shortly. Okay, so you've decided to get rid of debt. How does it work with that simple budgeting method that we taught you in lesson three? I want you to remember this magic formula. Your income minus your bills minus your savings equals your guilt-free spendable. Now, important caveat here, if you're in debt, then you don't have any savings. You have no savings if you're in debt. All your savings needs to go towards that debt repayment. So let's say you take home $1,000 a week, right? And your bills are $400 a week. And then you decide to set aside $100 every week to repay your debt. So that's gonna leave you $500 a week 
of your gross free spendable income. Now, if you stay within that spendable, in four weeks, you will have an extra $400 to put towards any debt that you may already have. So it's up to you to decide which debt elimination method you want to apply in order to spend this money on, right? Do you want to use Snowball or do you want to use Avalanche? Sometimes it makes sense to apply that extra money to some particular debt to uh, avoid accruing interest on new purchases. I can't speak today. So it's up to you and you have the freedom to decide what's best for you. However, if you do keep living by this method one week at a time, one month at a time, and you apply your, sav um, apply your savings to the debt of your choice one month at a time, eventually you're going to get out of death debt at some point. You know, in this example, you're going to be paying off $5,000 of debt in one year just by this scenario here. Now, the major tipping point on the journey of financial wellness happens when you're, you've minimized your debt to the level where you can afford paying your balances in full every month. This is, becomes a major milestone because at that point you can automate everything and forget, I mean, literally forget about managing your money. The system I'm about to show you right now is going to take care of all your payments automatically so that you don't need to stress anymore. Now, this simple system is absolutely something that everybody needs to set a goal in achieving. Now, once you've implemented the system of money management, you're going to lose about 80 to 90% of your associated money stress. You're gonna breathe a little freer, start seeing things differently. You're gonna free your mind to focus on bigger and better things. You know, you're just gonna to get to a whole new level, trust me, All right? So let's take a look at it. Step one, your money gets deposited into your checking account. Now, make sure you have direct deposited configured so that you don't have to worry about depositing checks timely or losing checks, or even in general, visiting the bank. You know, Eliminate that stress out of your life if you haven't already done so. Step two, configure all your bills to be paid automatically from your credit cards on their due date. All your bills will be paid automatically. You don't need to worry about bill payments anymore. You don't have, you never forget. You're never gonna have late fees or you know, incur any stress, anything like that. You can completely throw away thinking about paying bills from your life. Plus, by the way, as you're doing that, as these bills are being paid automatically, you're going to be earning cash back or miles or points, whatever your favorite reward is, right, while you're doing that. Step three, you're going to automate all the bills that cannot be paid by credit cards to be automatically paid from your checking account. Similarly, with step two, you're going to eliminate all the stress associated with monthly bill payments. You're never going to be late. Never gonna have incurring interest. The only difference is gonna be you're not gonna be getting those rewards like you would be from your credit card, right? Step four, automate all your credit cards to be paid automatically in full every billing cycle from your checking account. Now you never forget to pay your credit card. You never have a late fee. You never incur any interest on purchases because you always pay the entire new balance in full. And then last but not least, step five, you spend your guilt-free spendable amount from any credit card that you like. Use ones that will bring you the most perks for whatever occasion. So whether that be buying gas, going to a restaurant, checking into a hotel, whichever one is gonna be the best for you in your lifestyle. Now, once you've built this system, absolutely all your bills will be paid automatically on time. You'll never see late fees or interest charges. And then once a year, you'll have that cash back payment, which frankly, I recommend you spend rewarding yourself. I mean, buy yourself something that you love. Maybe it's that smartphone that comes out every year or something else. And you know, once you build this system, you're going to eliminate 80 to 90% of your money management stress. Now, one question we usually get is, how safe is it to use such a system? You know, what about overdrafts? Let's actually use these numbers that we had from our previous example and put it and plug it in here, show you how it works, right? So you have $1,000 that was plugged into your checking account. It's automatically deposited in there. And then 400 is subtracted and paid to the bill providers, right? Then you pay $500 guilt-free on your credit cards over here. So you can follow along, inflows $1,000, outflows $900. So where's the missing $100 left? It's still in your checking account. There's never an overdraft if you don't overspend routinely. However, there is one requirement to successfully running this system worry-free. You need to have enough cash in your checking account to cover one month of bills and one full balance payment across all of your credit cards. We call that being cash level. So consider the following scenario. Let's say you have 
$10,000 in your checking account. Your first credit card balance has $2,000 on it and your second credit card balance has $5,000 on it. And then all your monthly bills are $3,000. So if we were to consider a worst case scenario, all of your bills and your credit card payments came due on the exact same day. Worst case scenario, right? Now the cash in your checking account should be enough to cover all of these payments. So even though you seemingly have $10,000 in here, in reality, you don't because this money is reserved to cover all of your short-term obligations. This is what being cash level is. Now, let's say you've, able, you've been able to save some money and you have $2,000 more in your checking account. So now you have $12,000 total. Now you haven't, haven't paid down any debt at all. So your first credit card is still $2,000, second one's still 5,000 and your bills are still 3,000 a month. Now, because you have more cash in your checking account than your short-term obligations, now you have $2,000 of what we call free cash. So even though you have $12,000 in your checking account, you only have 2,000 of it available to you. This is your emergency fund. This is your safety net, your peace of mind. This is your protection from overdrafts and interest charges. And this is what you're growing. So it doesn't matter how much cash you have. What matters is how much free cash you have. You need to have at least $1 of free cash to run your automated personal money management system. Now, on the flip side of that, let's consider another scenario. Let's say your first credit card balance grew by $2,000. It's now at $4,000. Your second one is still at 5,000 and your bills are still 3,000. So now your short-term obligations total $12,000 for that month. And you only have $10,000 in your checking account. So now you're two grand short. This is what we call being in a cash hole. Now, when you're in a cash hole, then you can't pay all your credit card balances in full every cycle because then you're at risk of overdrafting your account. You need to, you need to time these payments and this is where the stress comes in, right? You don't wanna be in a cash hole. It's expensive and it's stressful. So if you are in a cash hole, your first goal needs to be getting out of it. Now, once you get out of it, then you can automate your finances and live money stress-free. Now, in order to get out of that cash hole, what you need to do is use that simple budgeting method that we've been talking about. You spend less than you earn. And then little by little, you start to achieve some success. So while you're in a cash hole, you can't fully automate your payments. However, you can start building the system automating all your bills with the exception of automating your credit card payment. You'll have to apply your credit card payments manually for some time until you can get out of that cash hole. Now, once you do get out of that cash hole, then you can start having some free cash and you can stop paying your credit card bills manually. And then you can, need, you can automate them so all your cards are paid in full, all the balances every month automatically. Then no more stress. Now we've heard several common excuses and some really healthy skepticism from people when it comes to this automation topic. You know, one of the first ones we hear a lot is, you know, I can't automate my finances because all my bills are coming in at different times and I need to time them to avoid overdrafts. You know, I hear you, that concern is valid. I understand that. But I would also argue that this is the exact reason why you need to build that automated system. You know, the system works. It's been proven many times over and over again and it does help and change people's lives. All you need is to get out of a cash hole if you're in one by using our simple budgeting method and then automate everything. You know, once you do that, you never have to pay bills manually. You're always gonna be on time, no overdrafts, no interest charges. You know, imagine having that burden taken off your life. Common excuse two is I can't automate because unexpected emergencies can bring disbalance and cause overdrafts. Now this may sound a little controversial, but we believe that there are virtually no unexpected emergencies. In fact, the majority of life's emergencies are actually reliably predictable. You know, we're all going to get sick sooner or later. Our cars break down and need expensive repairs at some point, and we're all going to have to replace our roofs on our houses. You know, none of these examples are emergencies. They can be and should be anticipated. Now, true catastrophic emergencies like the death of a family member or death of a primary breadwinner or something like that, that is something that should be insured through insurance companies. That shouldn't come out of pocket. But the other things that I was talking about just now, those are just poorly planned, predictable expenses. Now, there's an emergency fund that you can use to deal with these. We're actually going to talk about that in a lot of detail in our next lesson. And then third, you know, my spouse or my partner can overspend spontaneously on some credit card 
and bring havoc into our finances. Now, I want you to remember, money's not going to magically appear in your wallet. You need to clearly know what your numbers are, what your guilt-free spendable is. And once you know your numbers and you can clearly communicate that with your partner, then you're essentially going to empower them. Your spendable number is not limiting. It's empowering. We've seen many times over how people change their behavior once they know what their numbers are. They start planning, quote unquote, spontaneous spending. They spend within their budget because it's guilt free. Nobody wants havoc in their personal finances. Nobody wants that extra stress. So once you implement the system and you taste what life is like stress free, then you never want to go back to any previous bad money habits. So that's going to conclude today's lesson. You know, Benjamin Franklin, he said once that he would rather go to bed without dinner than to rise in debt. So some key takeaways I want you to get from today is to reject that everyone has debt mentality. You know, all that's doing is, is giving away your security, robbing yourself and your kids of your financial independence. It doesn't serve you at all. Also, use that simple budgeting method. Get yourself out of a cash hole if you're in one. Automate your finances, take that stress out of your life and you know, eliminate 80 to 90% of that money related stress. It is possible and it can be done. You can do it. I believe in you. And the only impossible journey is one that you never begin. And it always seems impossible until it's done. Those are two quotes from two very smart men. And so thank you again. My name is Jordan Fuller. I'm so glad I got to spend this time with you and that I'll get to spend the next few lessons with you. I look forward to seeing you all next week. So please stay safe and stay healthy and take care. And I will see you next week.